which arc in Wings of Fire is the best? To answer this question, I thought it would make the most sense to cover five of what I see as the most important aspects of the Wings of Fire books and give each arc a rating on each of these aspects. The five I've chosen are the plot, protagonist, supporting characters, character development, and themes. Then, after giving my individual rating on these, I'll give my thoughts on which <laughs> overall takes the cake. Or the, uh, uh do, do dragons eat cake? Let's start with the plots. The core of each arc, what actually happens? in them. Starting it off strong is Arc 1, which I am giving a 9 out of 10. The plot of Arc 1 was really good, I thought. It follows the Dragonets of Destiny as they explore the world, explore their place in it, and strive to end the war they are supposed to be destined to stop. Overall, it really followed through on the ideas it sets up and includes some fun twists and turns along the way. My biggest complaint, and the reason it isn't getting a 10 out of 10, is that the arc's ending was kind of just lucky. Like, Sunny's plan, or lack thereof, in bringing the three Sandwing Queens together really should not have worked out as well as it did, so it just kind of felt like an empty victory, but everything else about the arc was great, so just this one point off. Now on to arc 2. I am giving it a 6 out of 10. This arc's plot was all over the place. Book 6 begins, and it's like, school time, oh, and also there's a big scary psychic dragon who's going to be the main antagonist. But then book 7 comes along, and it's like, <laughs> forget that, we're going on an adventure, and also now Scarlet is the main antagonist. And then book 8 takes over, and we leave behind the entirety of the main cast until the end of the book when we just so happen to conveniently find a scroll that brings us back to the big spooky antagonist from two books ago. Then there's book nine, and once again we leave behind most of the main cast to follow Turtle as he does something. It wasn't super clear, but then we get to book ten, and can't we? <sighs> Much as I love him, promptly decides to spend half of the book on a side quest with almost zero main plot relevance, and when we finally do reach the climax, well, there's actually three separate climaxes, and they don't align with or depend on each other at all. There's the thematic and action climax at the Battle of Jade Mountain, with the spell making everyone empathize with each other, there's Kibli's character climax in refusing Darkstalker's offer of animus magic, and then there's the arc's true climax, with Darkstalker getting turned into Peacemaker. The entirety of Arc 2's plot felt kind of like Dewey had storyboarded a few different ideas for directions it could go, and then decided to pick and choose parts from each without molding them into some kind of a coherent whole. I don't know, maybe it was just me, but it felt kind of erratic, so I'm taking taking points off for its lack of uh, consistency. Alright, on to arc 3, which was a bit better in the consistency department. This arc follows Blue, Luna, Cricket, and Sundew as they piece together the mystery of Queen Wasp's control of the Hive Wings, the secrets behind the Tree Wars, and the evil plant that's going to take over everything. Oh and also Snowfall was there. Though it was hinted at, we didn't actually find the main plot of this arc until it was more than halfway over, and when we did finally stumble into the Breath of Evil, book 14 happened. The book was really good, I quite enjoyed it, but it felt more like a Legends novel than a main arc book. But at least the main conflict was consistent, even if we didn't really learn anything concrete about it until book 13. I'd give it slightly above arc 2 with a 7 out of 10 rating. <laughs> Alright, moving on to the protagonist. The main characters whose eyes we see through one book at a time. I'm giving the arc one protags another 9 out of 10. I loved them! Clay is the biggest cinnamon roll. Tsunami balances her feminine and, uh, aggressive sides very well. Glory is just an amazing queen. Starflight is the goodest boy, and Sunny is such a gem. There is one reason and one reason alone that they aren't getting a 10 out of 10. It is because I had to leave room above for the arc two protagonists! <laughs> I just love of this squad. Moon, fantastic. Winter, fantastic. Barrel, fantastic. Turtle, well, I mean, he was pretty good at the end of his book. Kimberly! <laughs> Honestly, it could have been my first, second, third, and fourth most disliked characters, plus Kibli as the protagonist, and I still would have given them a 10 out of 10. I'm only a little biased on this one. Oh, but wow, such fun, complex, relatable, and engaging characters to have as the main crew. Fantastic! And for arc 3, I'm giving them an 8 out of 10. Very enjoyable, each in their own right. Blue is so sweet. Cricket is such a nerd, and I say that in the most endearing way. Sundew's fiery spirit of justice was great. Snowfall at first was so bad I would have to put the book down, but by the end she was one of the greats, and Luna was a very enjoyable read for me. Overall, I have no critiques of these characters. For me, they just weren't quite as 
magical as the arc 1 and 2 protagonists, so maybe the rating should be 11, 12, and 10, but for the sake of consistency, because it would be kind of hypocritical if I wasn't, I've kept them to a 1 to 10 scale. Okay, let's move on to the less main, but certainly not less important characters, the supporting cast. These are basically all the characters whose perspectives we do not see from, the villains, the friends, the mentors, and everyone in between. These are the characters that breathe life into the broader world and really make the stories what they are. In our Arc 1, our main supports are Kestrel, Peril, Scarlet, Morrow, Seer, Blister, Blaze, and Burn, Coral, Riptide, Kinkajou, Deathbringer, Facebeaker, and the False Dragonette, Smolder, and Thorn, among many others. A strong set of supports indeed. For Arc 1, I'm awarding them a 9 out of 10. There's too many to jump into even a superficial analysis, so instead, this is just the vibe I got from them. Very difficult, but not impossible to beat. In Arc 2, our primary supporting characters are Kinkajou again, the Dragonettes of Destiny, Hailstorm, Scarlet, Chameleon, and Ruby and Emony, Vulture, Foslayer, and of course, Darkstalker. If any supporting cast could top Arc 1's, it would be this one, especially considering that the protagonist of Arc 1 itself moved into the supporting character role for the sequel. Just excellent all around. And onto Arc 3, we have in the supporting character role Wasp, Admiral, Cadell, Katie Did, Willow, Hawthorne, Langster, but with three Swordtail, Cottonmouth, and Lizard renamed Freedom. Also, some of the Jade Winglet showed up a little bit in parts, though <laughs> I did want more Ghibli in Book 15, if I'm being entirely honest. Overall, though, a very strong supporting cast, and mirroring the protagonist ratings, I'm giving it an 8 out of 10 as well. On the high quality end of the spectrum, just like not quite as brilliant as Arc 1 or 2's. Alright, up Next is character development. I've chosen to make this its own category because of how uniquely written the Wings of Fire books are. I think this would usually be subsumed by the protagonist category, but in Wings of Fire, character development is such an essential part of the story, it deserves its own highlight. Okay, arc 1. To boil it down as simply as I can, Clay learns he's not a monster, but rather a protector. Tsunami comes to terms with the fact that sometimes it's better not to be in charge of everything always. Glory finds where she's meant to be in the world. Starflight finds the courage to stand for what he believes in, and Sunny proves to herself and the world that we make our own destinies. 8 out of 10! Every character in its own book was awesome, but also Tsunami's character arc in particular felt like it never happened once the book was over. Like, book 1 Tsunami was classic Tsunami, then she had this wonderful growth in book 2, then she was back to being classic Tsunami in books 3, 4, and 5. I, I just wanted it to stick. I really did. And arc 2 had the same issue. To quickly recap, though, Moon finds the strength to be confident in herself and in her powers and to trust in her friends. Winter learns to stop being a racist jerk, and also the true meaning of family. <laughs> Para learns that violence isn't always a good answer, Turtle finds the courage to be a hero, and Kibli realizes it doesn't take superpowers to be someone worth caring about. Again, wonderful development within each book, and just like Tsunami, Winter's development kinda just disappears once his book is over. Like, he's right back to being the distrustful, overly aggressive jerk he was in book 6, but at least he overcame his racism. <laughs> Then we have arc 3. This arc did not have that problem. Blue continued to break rules so long as they had ample reason to after moving up to Piaget's final stage of moral development. Cricket continued to be confident in her identity, Sundu continued to not hate all hive wings for the things that happened before they were born, and Snowfall and Luna weren't really around after the books long enough to tell, but both of them absolutely did have wonderful arcs, with Snowfall overcoming her paranoia and Luna learning then teaching you can empathize even with your enemy. Every single one of these and especially Sundu and Snowfall could serve as prime examples of how to do character development right, and I actually have a video on that. Tui was always really skilled at weaving character development seamlessly into the plot, but Arc 3 is where she really showed off just how good she is at it, and for that reason, I'm giving it a 10 out of 10 for Arc 3, no doubts in my mind. And finally, the themes of the arc, what messages and ideas stood at their core. Within arc 1, we have themes of family and of destiny. It asks the reader to consider who one's family truly is and suggests that the strongest bonds are not the ones based in genetic similarities, but rather are the ones built through shared experiences, endeavors, and mutual care. Through the theme of destiny, the arc explores ideas of agency and predetermination, ultimately putting forward the idea that we forge our own paths and that it is our decisions which determine our futures. 10 out of 10? 
10 beautiful themes and they're each woven into the story so well. Arc 1 nailed it with its themes. Okay, on to Arc 2. We have trust, empathy, and identity. It asks readers who they should trust, how to know who to trust, how feeling what others feel may change our own perspectives, and what it means to be yourself, especially when magic is involved. Oddly, the arc spent about five entire books suggesting that we shouldn't use magic to change who a dragon is against their will, but then resolve the main conflict by using magic to change who a dragon was against their will. I, I, I guess it was like a taste of his own medicine, but it was a strange resolution. Still, I really enjoyed the themes, and other than the ending, everything fit nicely, 9 out of 10. Finally, with arc 3, we have empathy again, but this time specifically for enemies, as well as themes of unity and freedom. How do we see from the eyes of those who have wronged us or been wronged by us? How might we put aside differences to come together for a cause greater than ourselves, and what does it mean to be free? Much like in arc 2, the themes were great, but they just didn't quite make it the entire arc. Book 15 attempted to do a lot with the story while keeping the page count the same as Wings of Fire books typically do. In my opinion, this resulted in two of the main themes, freedom and unity, being by and large left out until the very, very end so that the theme of empathy could be fully developed in the space they had. Personally, I just would have liked a longer book with all the themes being fully developed, but alas, it was not to be. So I'm awarding arc 3 an 8 out of 10 for its themes. And there are all of the individual rankings now for a final decision on which arc was the best drum roll please well, it depends on which things you find more important. If it's the plot, the story, the ideas you read a book for, I would say Arc 1 did a spectacular job with those. If it's the characters instead that you enjoy most, I would say Arc 2 was far and away the best. And if it's growth you like to see, the development of characters into something more than they were, I think Arc 3 would be your cup of tea. For me, personally, I think characters are the most important part of any story, so Arc 2 is the one I would choose as the best Arc in Wings of Fire, but that's just me. In any case, I hope you enjoyed this breakdown. Let everyone know which arc you thought was the best in the comments, and thank you for watching.